Martin. Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon. Welcome everyone for Asian Philosophies. Today we are going to talk about the computer and versus uh, ancient Go game. And we have uh, Steve here to talk about uh, the ancient game of Go. Um, <clears throat> this is the second section regarding the Go game. So uh, Steve, welcome, please. Thank you. Uh, did you want to introduce your schedule like you often do in the beginnings? Uh, no, that that'll be fine. You know, uh, next week we were going to talk about the uh, uh, Bhagavad Gita, and SK will be here for next week, and then uh, and the week after we are going to talk about the Chinese history, the ancient di uh, dynasty of Zhou. And then we uh, we move on for more subject about Asian philosophy. Please pay attention to our uh, <clears throat> meetup announcement. I will post uh, next week's on the schedule on the chat. So Steve, you can start. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm Steve Monday. Um, I a little bit of background on me. I was a high school teacher for my first act and. And I worked for GE for a while, and these days I crawl around in databases. Um, I uh, fell in love with the game of Go about uh, almost nine years ago now, I think. And so I've been playing for a while. I've done this uh, couple of presentations a few times. Well, the first one I did a couple of weeks ago was just on the history of Go. This one is on Go and AI, and it's it's jump around a little bit. I tweaked it a little bit to, to hopefully make it a little more philosophical, given this is a philosophy group, um, thinking about artificial intelligence and what is intelligence and how can you produce intelligence. Um, but it's going to jump around a little bit. We're going to talk about um, a little bit, brief run through of the history of Go, show you an example of a, uh, a simple game, uh, just so you get a feel for what it looks like. And uh, then we're going to talk about um, how that's a bit about how the brain works and how uh, neural networks, uh, AI uh, works, and then explain how that worked to go. And it'll it'll end with uh, well, it'll next to last. I talk about sort of the uh, Kasparov equivalent when uh, Deep Blue beat uh, the best chess player in the world back in the '90s. Um, it actually took till 2016 before computers could beat the best Go players in the world. Go, the rules are simple, simpler than chess significantly, but the consequences are more complex and they had to employ neural network techniques to be able to even get at uh, it being able to be competitive with the best human players. So with that, I am going to, let's see, I'm going to turn off my camera in case I need to stick my nose up close to the screen to what I'm looking at. So you're not looking at my nose. And then I'm going to share, whoops, okay. share screen, share screen, share. And hopefully you're seeing a presentation. That off to the side a bit, put it in presentation mode. Okay, can you guys see my screen okay? Okay, I can barely see names on the right. So somebody, for, if, by all means, interrupt me if you have questions. I truly don't have a problem with that. Um, because I'm on a single monitor here, I might not be able to see you, like raise your hand. So maybe Jason, you can kind of police that a little bit and, and interrupt me at any point. So I'm happy to do that. Okay, no problem. Okay. So... A, a Go is is uh, an ancient Chinese game. It is the oldest board game in the world. Um, and this talk is going to be AI and the game of Go and a little bit about what is intelligence. Put page it in. Okay, great. My keyboard's not working. This is fantastic. There we go. Oh, it's too much stuff in my way. Let me figure out how to... Well, I'm just going to have to deal with it. Okay. All right. Um, so Go is the most ancient board game um, in the world. It's been played continuously for 25 to 3,500 years, depending on how you count it. That's what the last talk was about. 
um, with basically the very same rules over all of that time, very little change in the game. The rules are very simple, but it's a very deep game. Um, there, it's a very deep game. Like you, the, the, the saying is it takes 15 minutes to learn the rules and the rest of your life to learn how to play well. It's barely known in the West, but it's extremely popular in the in the Far East, um, China, Japan, and Korea in particular. Like there are, you know, it's in the newspaper games that are going on, competitions that are going. There, there are cable channels devoted to watching the game of Go. So it's pretty well known there. I'm going to breeze through the entire last presentation in one slide um, on terms of the history of Go. The game was created in China. Uh, most likely in the second millennium BC. Um, there's evidence from burials where they have ghost stones uh, buried in crypts. They believe they're ghost stones. They go back to uh, over a thousand BC. And if they were already putting them in crypts, you can imagine it must've been pretty important by that time. Around the fifth century, it migrated to Korea. Um, one of my favorite stories from the Korea segment is uh, they're about a, a Baduk. Go is called Baduk in Korea and Wei Chi in China, and Go in Go in America, Ego in Japan. So in in Korea, there was a Baduk playing spy story where one kingdom, in the Three Kingdoms period, one of the kings uh, had a Go playing uh, person in his court. And he sent him to the other court to kind of wander in there and act like a mendicant priest and behave, uh, you know, get to know the, the leader of the other country who enjoyed playing Go. And he talked him into spending all kinds of money on his kingdom and depleted the, the coffers of the kingdom. And so then the first king walked in pretty well and took over the place without a fight. So Go, go plays a part in world affairs. Migrated to Japan in about the seventh century. That's what this picture here is representing. I, I call this picture uh, Go Rage Quit. Um, it's actually about a samurai who was playing a game. He wasn't armed. He didn't have his sword with him, and he got attacked. So he picked up the Go board, which the floor Go bonds are these huge blocks of wood. They're like five inches thick and, you know, a little over a foot, but a little over a foot square, big, massive blocks of, blocks of wood, and he defended himself with it. It spread to the West um, in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. And through the 20th century, it's become worldwide, though it is still much less known here. Um, but it is an international intellectual sport. And they have uh, Go competitions, Go Cup competitions with prizes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so any quick questions about the history of Go before I move on? Okay, so then what about the history of AI? <clears throat> Thinking of AI is very general, the history of artificial intelligence. And I found this kind of interesting when I when I started thinking about it because, you know, it, it's I kind of am telling the story on this slide through how we think it works. Like what's the mechanism? And, you know, the earliest artificial intelligence would have been like golems. Um, in, in Jewish faith and, and other, just God created uh, the um, Hephaestus, you know, created uh, mechanical beings. And what made them work? Well, magic or godlike powers. You know, that was sort of the earliest. How, how could you possibly make an artificial intelligence? Well, you have to be some sort of all-powerful magical being. And then we get into the mechanistic age um, and, you know, the steampunk age is depicted here. I'll tell you a little bit about this guy in a second. He's kind of amusing. Um, you know, robots became a thing and it was physical mem physical mechanisms, gears and wheels. That's how we would make something we could fashion. We could probably fashion a mind using gears and wheels and pulleys and who knows. You know, that's the way you thought things were, were put together. This guy here, by the way, is, um, uh, what's his name, Boilerplate. Uh, he was created in 2000, despite the picture. But what's funny about him is he now has this whole mythology uh, behind him where he has been Photoshopped into old pictures. And you can see him, he was, he was in his mythology is that he was developed as a soldier uh, in the 1800s, and you can see pictures of him with Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, and you can see pictures of him with Pancho Villa fighting the Spanish-American War, and 
all kinds of places. So he's a he's a funny little fellow. Well, then we get to the electronic age, computers. And so we begin to think of intelligence and the mind and representing how we think digitally, electronically. New mechanism that didn't exist before, just like mechanics that didn't exist in the more distant past. I was actually, I uh, didn't mention about on the mechanistic age, it actually goes back further than I thought. They were actually making bait some automatons back in the Greek days. I was surprised to learn that. Modern AI, I'll call it, starts around the 1950s, where they're really trying to use these computers to make intelligent machines, machines that can solve problems, answer questions. And the early versions were, they're called expert systems or decision trees. They were logic that was like, if this, then that, if that, then something else, um, to work your way through a problem. And so you kind of had to understand the problem well enough to create a decision tree that would accomplish that. And in fact, the, the 1990s uh, Deep Blue was essentially that. It was sort of a brute force uh, method in playing chess where it would play out all kinds of different variations and then using decision trees, you know, decide what was the best uh, course of action, essentially. But that didn't work for Go. Go um, is a board played on a 19 by 19 grid. And there are literally more board positions than there are atoms in the universe, believe it or not. This, you know, exponential things get big fast. Not all of those are good positions, but there are more positions than there are atoms in the universe. Well, how did they get at it? Through deep learning. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next. Now, I meant to show you the game and I, I forgot to break out to do that. So I'm gonna back off and just show you an example of what a board looks like. Oh, that's That's how to teach the rules, which I'm, going to try and not do. Tonight, um, I didn't mention this in the beginning, I hit a limit at 6.30 my time, so a little over an hour, so I'm abbreviating just a little bit, but that's the one that I want to do. All right. So the board's played on 19 by 19. Um, you take turns placing stones on the board, and they do not move. Um, and you, what you're trying to do is surround more territory than your opponent. Um, if a st stone or stones get completely surrounded, then they're removed from the board. That's basically the rules. And so a game might look something like this. Here are the first few moves. Notice the first few moves are in the corner. That's because if I want to surround area in the board, I've already got two walls behind me. So it's more efficient to try and start in the corner to begin to surround some territory. This is starting to surround some territory. This, you can actually jump in here and take that away. Like a white stone in there could actually take that away, but you're going to be giving up something in exchange. So then you start to reach out. Whoops, where is the, go oh, that one. So, you know, White has a stone over here. Black says, you can't have all that corner. White says, fine, I want some of it. And Black says, okay, I'll take the other half of the corner. So they've kind of divided this corner up a little bit. Then White says, well, you can't have all of that corner. Black says, yeah, but I want it. White says, not all of it. Black says, okay. White says, okay. There's a little bit more reasoning behind why these next two moves are played, but they're solidifying positions. Black wants to move there and white moves there. And so again, black is starting to get some territory down here and white's starting to get probable territory over there. And so the game continues like that. And so this is what uh, an opening might look like. This is a very peaceful opening. Nobody has tried to invade inside someone else's territory and take it away. But you can see how it's beginning to, to form areas around the side of the board where you're beginning to take more space control more territory. And like I said, you start in the corners, then you end up kind of working on the sides because again, you got a wall behind you. And then later in the game, you start to reach out and try and take parts of the middle. So again, uh, we have a, I think I see a raised hand happening. Go ahead. 
No, 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 Jason here. I, I just when you if you are ready, and I think you, you probably will be helpful if you can show the ending of the game and how does Kansas win or lose, you know. What the end of the game looks like? Yes, if if you can show the audience, if you have something to show, I believe they would be helpful. Sure, that's a good idea. If I could get this thing is in my way up here. I don't know how to make it go away. Ah. I can't get the the bar from Zoom. There we go. There, I'll put it at the bottom. Okay, give me just a moment and I will do exactly that. Let's see if we can find a picture of a game. I didn't lose the other thing I hit up. Good. Okay. Um, so let's look at for one that really looks now oh, they're just showing me the game everywhere. Well, I thought it would be easier to find a... That's a little better. Here we go. So I'm going to try and make it bigger, but th this is what it looks like after a while. You see how they've kind of crowded into the middle. As I take a quick look at this board, it seems pretty clear. White has some territory over here. Um, let's see. It's a little harder to see black. That looks connected. This looks like a very white game to me off the cuff. That looks like a very white game. There's a little bit of ter black territory over here. That's connected out. So I think that's probably, that's not the best example. Let's look at this one. That's maybe worse. Now you can see what it looks like. I'd like to find one that has a little clearer definition. Here we go. Black clearly has some territory here. White has some territory here. Black has some territory there. These stones are, uh, they're, they're dead. You know, white would only have to play right there and then these three stones are completely surrounded and would be removed from the board. So white has some territory down here. So that's a little bit of what the, the finished game looks like. You can see black had to reach out to the middle to get some territory in this particular game. These stones are dead, they're, called, they're surrounded. So there's an example. Does that set, show you what you were hoping to see? I think Karim has the hands up. Uh, okay. Yes, I, I have a question. So in this particular case, what would uh, prevent the black side uh, to take control over the upper left corner? Can they put some pieces in there and kind of block the, subtle, the, subtle the white question. pieces? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a concept of being alive in Go. And I'm not going to get away without showing this. So let me show this. Um, there's a concept of being alive and go. These stones here, or you see how they're completely stranded on the outside, and one more white stone. Well, I need to show you there. Takes them out. However, again, something in my way. There we go. Down here. White could not kill this group because they could try putting a stone there, but see how it still has one space open on that group? And if I put a white stone there, it would be dead. It would, it's surrounded. So this group has two eyes, and in the game of Go, two eyes means life. That group cannot be killed. Nothing you can do. And anything attached to it, maybe it's got a string going over this way and a string going down that way that kind of surrounds the corner cannot be killed. So to answer your question, what would have to happen is black would have to jump in here and make two eyes. And if black was allowed 10 moves in a row, that would be pretty easy. But unfortunately, you got to give white a turn. And so if black were to try and jump in there, white would make moves that would prevent black from getting two eyes and instead surround the black stones. Does that make sense? So the follow-up question then. So I yeah, I see how it, it's a little 
obviously it's a, l a little more complicated <laughs> than <laughs> what meets the eye there but um why would on the basis of that 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 black cannot have a good game there in that upper left corner is mm -hmm. that why is that why we're saying that the white pieces have that corner uh counted at, you know as as yeah. their territory yes and in fact the way the game ends is both players decide they can't do anything more that will gain them more points and they pass and if black thinks they can get in there and move and make make a life go for it one of the wonderful things about this game it's a little hard to explain to until you played a little bit if i black plays in there and white responds in there the relative score has not changed there's one black stone that becomes a prisoner point for white and there's one white stone in there which becomes one less point one minus one is zero so one of the lovely things about this game is there's no harm in trying you can jump in and find out eventually it will become clear so so how would you count points like in this particular case if, if you just look at the uh at that corner only right so the no. edges count as well and so it's literally one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one this is a prisoner so twenty two if i did that right? i guess i didn't count these so maybe twenty oh, but for that black piece to be a prisoner you, you still have to put the white piece uh above it right in the uh, if black plays in here D, and white D12. Plays. Yeah. Uh D twelve. Do, do you have um to this is considered dead. So when you begin scoring, the first thing you do is remove stones that are dead. I am going to suggest that we say your questions. Are you going to come back for the day we're actually going to try and play the game? Um, I yeah, I'm planning on it. Yeah. Excellent. I will entertain infinite number of those kinds of questions in that talk. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And anyone interested in the actually play the game or know, really know how does the game plan, uh, can you put a, a note in the chat so I can have a count so we will know or you can send the uh, mes uh, a meetup message to me so we will know how many people are interested to uh, play the game. Or at least watch the game play. Okay, thank you. Yes. yes. Yeah. One Please one thing I, I I like to share is for a lot of time I see people play the game. I have no clue who is winning, and they already decide. You know who is yeah. winning. You know, so that's constantly happen for the uh, experienced player because they know they have no way to win. So they say, okay, we done next game. So. <laughs> Right. And it's another aspect of the game that is wonderful is there is a really fantastic uh, handicap system. So if you have two players that are very different levels of experience, um, the weaker player, which usually plays black, starts with some stones on the board and it becomes, becomes a very difficult game for both players if you get the handicap set right. So, yeah, I look forward to doing that. Um, and yes, as he said, we'll need to get a count because when we do try to get ready to play it, I'll be asking people to do some setup ahead of time. There are Go servers where you can play Go online, and I'll be using that to try and teach the game and have you guys give a chance to, to play it. All right, let me catch up to where I was. I think I was here. Okay. So let's get a little philosophical here. The human mind. There's lots of ideas of what the mind is. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to stick to a fairly biological view. Um, it is uh, neurons. It is, a, it is a feature of, of neurons firing. So this biological view is that you, your brain is full of uh, literally billions of neurons, about 100 billion neurons with trillions of connections between them. So each neuron has a myriad connections to other neurons around it. Whoop. Electric signals travel from neuron to neuron. And at the connection gap, which is called the synapse, you may remember from your high school biology, there's a little chemical reaction that happens. And so the upstream cell releases some chemicals into this very, very tiny gap. And it takes no time for the other side to sense those 
and decide whether there's enough of those chemicals for this neuron to fire. And so at the connection gap, the synapse, there's a chemical threshold to trigger the next neuron. If this one doesn't get hit with enough electricity to release enough, then the next neuron will not fire. And in fact, these uh, signal can go both ways. This chemical signal can say, hey, next neuron, you should really fire. Or the chemical signal could say, hey, next neuron, you should really not fire. It's both positive and negative reinforcement. And the biological view, and the question I will raise, is thinking simply an emergent result of these connections. I think it is. Um, that is a whole other topic, a whole other talk unto itself to talk about what the human mind is and, and, and how it comes about. This is the view I'm going to go with in here, or at least I'm going to compare this view to an equivalent, nearly equivalent computer emulation of this that seems to render some intelligence, interestingly enough. So I will try to leave that question there because as I say, that will become a whole other conversation, whether you think it's a gift from God or whether you think it's mechanical or whether you think it's part of a larger consciousness, there are all sorts of views of the human mind. I'm gonna talk about this version of it and a computer equivalent of it essentially. And the computer equivalent is neural networks. So what they've done in software, there are, there's a whole other realm of computing that tries to make sort of hardware versions of the brain, but this, this is software, this is just numbers. But the numbers are calculating, and um, this is sort of an imitation of brain wiring. You can think of each one of these little circles as a neuron, and you can think of each one of these little connections as the connection to a different neuron. And, it turns out the map is actually dead simple. If this neuron has a value of five, and this value has a number of six, and this value has a number of three, for example, and each of these connections has a weight to them, a number to them. And so what gets communicated to this neuron, for example, looks like it's got one coming from there, it's got one coming from there, and it looks like there are three others. So actually, it's coming from all five of them, isn't in this picture. And you literally take the number associated with this neuron times the number associated with the weight, this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, and you do add, this neuron gets its own little adder, B, which could be positive number, negative. And that becomes a new number. And so the number is sort of the strength of the neurons firing. That number could be positive or negative. There's one other subtlety here. And for those of us uh, with a little, little bit of a mathematical bent, I'll explain that this function is basically taking whatever number what this is and scaling it usually between negative one and one. And so a positive one means, hey, next neuron, you should absolutely fire. And the negative one says, hey, next neuron, you should definitely not fire. And so it comes into the next neuron, but of course that neuron has other inputs to it. It's not just this guy's opinion coming out, it's several opinions coming out. The math is dead simple. It is literally this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, plus a, plus a constant, and a little function that's a little sneaky, but that's what just scales it to negative one at once. The numbers don't just become all kinds of different magnitudes. And what you do then is you have numbers going in, you have weights, and you end up with these output neurons having numbers associated with them. And those numbers will tell you a true or false. It'll tell you cat or elephant or penguin or elephant, as you see down here. And so what you do then is you train this network. It starts out not knowing what all these weights are. And you put some inputs in, and it's a, you put some inputs in from whatever picture it is you have, picture or whatever input in the game of Go, their game states, which I'll explain in a minute. You put those in, it runs through this map and comes out with the opinion, why, yes, that's a penguin. And then you tell it, no, it's not. And it goes, oh, okay, well, let me change the weights around a little bit. And you put the inputs back in. It says, okay, that is clearly a donkey. 
He's like, no, no, it's not. So, okay, let me play around with the weights. So training an AI system is simply providing inputs, letting it figure out what it thinks is the answer, and then you tell if it's right or wrong. And if it's right, those weights get those weights get more emphasized. That was the right combination of weights to give you the answer. And if it's wrong, then they change. They change them until they get weights that make it happen. Mysteriously, this ends up being able to put in some numbers here and get the numbers out here that tell you the correct answer. Um, I'm seeing a hand raised, I think. Uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you were saying uh, mysteriously, and then before that, you were talking about training it. And I, I, I just wanted to um, just clarify in my head that we're still dealing with like decision trees and additive point table type logic that's producing pattern recognition tables of numbers that are then more efficiently weighted against things that appear like those in the training library? Is that it? That, I'm trying to understand how the neural network does the yeah. things. Yeah, decision tree really does mean something else. Think of that more as like if then kind of statements. If this, then that, if this, then that. This turns into essentially a matrix equation. Um, so it's not decision trees. Um, it's it's neural networks. This, this is what a neural network is. Um, I'm not sure I answered your question though. Do you want to clarify if I did not? Well, you said it's not a decision tree because uh, like OLAP or uh, it's math, R but it's not a decision tree. Okay, so like a more of a three dimensional tree or mapping versus just a flat two D. Uh... No, um, no, I'm not sure how to how to clarify it. Um, do do you have you do you have any experience with programming by any chance? I do. I have uh, like with developing with ISing through like vector libraries and pattern recognition and. Um, right. So in programming, I mean, if thens in that sense is what a decision tree uh, kind of is. It's 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 more hard coded. You're not playing with weights. It's predetermined. The decision tree is going to tell you the same answer every time. It doesn't have this reinforcement. Tweak the weights and try again. Tweak the weights and try again. This has um, what they call supervised learning. You are the supervisor telling it whether it's a penguin or not. Okay, but wouldn't it still be more or less going into that mysterious process against uh, like a vet, a, 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 a function that's, I'm just trying to figure out how, how it's concluding, like when it, uh, it trains the library. So when it receives that identical or input, it goes to the, you know, it's identified. So, so the matrix, let's say it has one end node out here, and that the end node ends up being negative uh, one, zero, or one. And negative one means the data that it was given was a penguin. Zero means it was, I can't see my picture down there, but that one is because this thing's in the way. And one means it's an elephant. And so it will put out zero. You'll tell it whether it was right or not. Um, I don't, I feel like I'm not answering your question very well. It's, it's a mathematical equation. I guess the, the, the backward propagation aspect of it, like when it goes, yep. when it's training the library so that in the future it's weighted heavily, more heavily, if it more closely matches, you know, Correct. a previous expectation. That's kind of how I'm curious about how the, you know, it's the deeper part is achieved. I'm going to show you a demo here in just a minute that may help make that clear for you. Let's let let me get to that and then see if you still have a question. Did I see that there was another hand up too? Yeah, Joe has hands hands up. Yeah. Hi. Um, so, how does it overcome uh, developing a bias? Excellent question. That's what this last bullet down here is about. It's only going to be as good as your training data. There is a famous example of DARPA doing an early version of this in the 1980s where they wanted to develop an AI, a neural network that could tell us, take a picture of the woods and tell you whether there was a tank hidden in there. And so they fed it lots of pictures. Some of them just woods and some of them woods with tanks in it. 
I would input the pictures. And in that case, the numbers are different aspects of the picture, color, picture, pixel location. I'm not fluent enough in this to know exactly how it's encoded. But they mm. put the pictures in and they got a tool out that seemed to be working great. It, it, their test data, every picture they gave it with a tank, it told it was a tank. Every picture that didn't have a tank, it did not have a tank. So they thought, great, let's go show this to the generals. They took it into the generals and they took they took some other pictures, some just, you know, random pictures they hadn't trained on. And it did terribly. Right. What they found out is in their training data, in their test pictures, nobody wants to go trudging out and put a tank in the woods in the rain. All of the pictures with tanks in the woods were on relatively sunny days. Many of the pictures that did not have tanks in the woods were on cloudy days. That's what the computer figured out. And that's why I'm using the word mysterious is we really don't quite understand. We, we can't explain how these numbers come up with the answer. And in that case, what it was really doing is they developed a very sophisticated weather detector. The computer was really telling them whether there were clouds or not. There are all kinds of implications for this. You've probably seen in the news where, you know, this face recognition uh, stuff that's been created works better on white faces than brown faces because they gave it mostly white faces to train it. So there's a lot of danger in the training data, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, so it's yeah. playing a game uh, such as Go, uh, and it... Um uh is deciding whether or not to try a new move yes uh, okay. that so, so that's so that's like because if you develop the bias obviously you're not going to try the new move so how does it overcome that we're going to see that in a, in a couple slides cool any other questions So I wanted to talk about this down here to bring it back to the human mind, because we have actually identified in the brain clusters of neurons that fire for different reasons of visual input. Um, there are some that fire when a vertical line appears in your field of vision. These neurons are going click, 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 click. There's a different bundle of neurons that fire when you have a horizontal line, all these different angles. And so then your brain the, in the, the computer program, there are very distinct layers. The brain is not distinct layers, but there are further groupings of neurons that then begin to assemble these. And hey, when you see a vertical line and a little bit of horizontal line, a different bit of neurons could go bang, 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 and say, hey, I see one of those. And then they put the picture together a little bit more. When I see this and this and this, a certain number of neurons start to, and it eventually starts to form a picture, in this case, a literal picture, um, and the brains are firing here, and the other part of your brain says, hey, I know what that is. That's an elephant. So the brain does, in fact, do a layered sort of thing like this that assembles a picture, and then your uh, your mind puts it together, and you're, there's a different part of your brain that, that bang, bang, bangs when you use the word elephant. And those get connected, and they associate each other, and that's how you, that is the biological uh, explanation for how we think, or how we think. Okay, let me see which is the next slide. Okay, so here we're jumping right into now, how does AlphaGo work? Okay, um, oh, I wanted to show you the demo first, because this is pretty cool here. Whoop. Get to here and here. This is a little online site Playground tensorflow.org. It's kind of cool. You can change the number of neurons in here. You can change the number of layers of neurons in here. And you can change the target. Um, in this case, we're wanting to uh, see this pattern. And I'm going to run it here. See, yeah, it's starting to see the pattern, right? And it's like you have one set of neurons that fires when orange is to the left of blue, and you have another set of neurons that fire when blue is above orange. And blue is a positive reinforcement, orange is a negative reinforcement. 
So this neuron is saying this neuron is getting almost no input from this guy. See how faint there's a line there? But it's saying, oh, yep, it's this one. So sure enough, those look kind of the same. This one is really taking most of its feedback from here. This one. And so, and so now we start to combine these. I'm looking for one. Let me try. I want to get one that has a really demo. I hit it saved, and then when I closed and reopened my browser, I lost it. Put one that has a really clear picture of this. You can see how they stack up better. I want I want fewer things over here if I can get it. Okay. It's not really settling on the picture on that one. It's going to be coming unstable, interestingly, thematically. I'm trying to inform neurons there. And again, there's you can't really explain exactly what it's doing here, so you just kind of have to play around a little bit. Boy, I want a simple picture. And I had one, and I apologize that I lost it when I turned my browser off. There we go. This one's nice. So um, this one is a whole lot of that one and a whole lot of that one. And if you kind of take those two and lay them on top of each other, blue, blue in the upper right-hand corner, yeah. The, uh, and it's got, I guess it's got some negative of this one. Let's look good at the end. It's easier to see. So in the end, you've got this neuron, which has the pattern this way, and this neuron, which has the pattern that way. It says, give me a lot of that one and give me a lot of not that one. And sure enough, the end pattern looks like orange, orange, blue, blue, and not the other way around. So this is a neat little demo. I, it, it, did, does this did this help a little bit with the question you had before about what the neuron, what the um, how the neural network is trying to produce an answer? This is a lot to cram in to you in a short talk. I recognize that, and I, and I have no idea what your all's backgrounds are. Um, but are there any questions at this point? Okay, well, this is a fun little demo thing you can play out and you can really see how they are positively and negative reinforcing. And whatever is happening in here is producing the target image. This, this is the okay. image that is being fed and being reinforced on. Keep playing with the weights until you get that picture. These are the weights it's coming up with. Uh, so I think I do see Rick's hands. So we have a medicine and uh, a Madeleine and and uh, uh, Joe. Okay. It's all right. I'm in uh, Madeline, Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just I want to say thank you, Steve. Um, I can kind of see what the analogies are to uh, biological neural networks. Um, I know this is a simplified presentation of how the AI does it. Um, in real life, in uh, neurological networks, um, each neuron can put out more than one type of chemical signal. It can affect not just multiple neurons around it, but it can act as a mode for different types of network. So it's not the straightforward kind of matrix uh, that you had showed with all the lines going between the different columns of dots. Absolutely. But, but I think that this um, thing, presumably a, neur a neuron is in quotation marks. It's a neuron represents a, uh, uh, a go piece. I like this because it has the inhibitory feature. So mm -hmm. I guess uh, it means that there's um, an inhibitory feature to the code just as some neurons and entire um, neural nets networks will put out an inhibitory effect on things. And sometimes you need a stimulus that removes a constant inhibition in order to have action take place. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Yes, the, the neurons in the brain are connected in a myriad ways. Um, there are positive, in the math, this is simply a negative number, and this is a positive number. In the brain, it is, does the chemical uh, reaction cause an, a, cause an electrical signal in the next neuron to be more likely to fire or less likely to fire? And we know that that does happen in brain neurons. 
And so, yes, this is a simple model. This was somebody's idea. Like maybe we can kind of simulate the brain in math. Let's see what it does. It turns out it does some pretty powerful things. Uh, next question, I guess. So we have Joe and uh, Jameson. So. Actually, I'm good. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was just, I was looking at the data feature with the noise and that's all, nothing, nothing. I, I figured it out. Oh yeah. Go play with this thing. It's fun. <laughs> And uh, ja Jameson, yeah. Jameson, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, just to clarify, because I know you were using the analogy of biological neural nets, and uh, just for clarity, uh, we are talking about, yeah, we do know, you know, biologically all those chemicals and all that other fantastic stuff, but we are just using a comparison. And this is, we are looking at, um, from my understanding, it, because I'm I'm genuinely uh, interested in trying to help articulate how this library works, and um, I understand it's a it's a, a, a for all intents and purposes like a dynamic array, right? So it and those are numbers, <laughs> so those are different uh, in like they populate weighted numeric values that produce a decision. Is that am I correct? And assuming yes, that, it is essentially it, at its base, it is essentially a matrix equation where the numbers and, and the weight matrix are shifting and being through the reinforced learning. And in and in the biological, as was it Madeline pointed out, you know there there are more than one chemical in that in that synapse that's that's deciding what's. We are simplifying that synapse connection by the math to say how likely is the next neuron to fire or to not fire. But yeah, it's a matrix equation. Okay, shall I go on? Okay. This will be again. Ah, takes me back to the beginning. Okay, so how does AlphaGo work? So you can see here's the beginning, and you notice they are starting to play in the corners first. This is very early in the game. This is a case where Black played that 4-4, four, four, and remember I said White could jump inside and, and take that corner away. That's what's happening here. This is a very common pattern. In the game of Go, there are things called joseki, with the Japanese word for it. And they are, they are common patterns. And the patterns are common because they end up giving both players about the same value. In this case, white is getting some points in here, but black is getting a wall out here. And with one more black stone out here, they're going to begin to take some space and to take some territory. Um, but the way AlphaGo is working, so at each move, it uses a game state of the last seven moves as inputs to the neural network. So I had a picture on the last page with like five neurons, seven neurons. You know, On the website, there were three and four neurons in a layer. AlphaGo is 12 layers deep. In other words, there are 12 sets of neurons from left to right. And they have, um, uh, let's see which one, I'm trying to remember which number. It's uh, uh, thousands of connections with millions, th thousands of neurons with millions of connections. Big matrix equation, okay? The input is the game state. So does this stone have a white stone? I, actually, I believe the way they did it is, does this stone have a white stone or not? They, they actually do the white stones and the black stones separately. That's a subtlety that we don't really care too much about. But the, the initial state is really basically, is there a white or black stone here? Is there a white or black stone here? Is there a white or black stone here? That goes into a matrix, which is the input to this big neural net. And so, and it's even bigger because it's using the last seven moves as input to the neural net. The output to the neural net is who eventually wins this game. And so what it is doing then is it's doing a Monte Carlo search for math people will probably know what that is, but basically it just means it's trying a bunch of different moves. And if those moves are more likely to get a win, it'll it'll try harder on that move. It'll go further on that move. And for each move, it runs a neural net on that game state and says, who eventually wins this game? 
And so some of the moves that it chooses, and in this little diagram, the green spots are the ones that are considering moves that are more likely to cause, it, let's say it's Black's, it's a, yeah, it is Black's turn here. I think this was the last move. So it's Black's turn. And so it's saying these green spots on here are moves that are more likely to end up in a game with Black winning. And so it explores a whole bunch of moves. It decides which one is the best. In this case, it's that move right there with a little blue circle. And then from there, it steps forward and says, let me look at a bunch of moves after that. Let's look at white's next round of moves. Which one of white's moves would make white most likely to win? And it picks the best one of those. And then it goes to the next layer. And it's, it's sort of stepping forward, trying it. If the move is more likely, I can barely see, this is where I'm going to stick my nose to the screen so you don't get to look at my face too close. There are tiny little numbers in here. It looked at this one 61 times, this one 49 times, this one 77 times. It went 77 moves deep to see how good a move that is. These fainter ones, it didn't do that many times. These that have no color, it hardly touched those at all. It decided immediately, yeah, that's not the most likely way for black to win. I'm not even going to think about it much longer. The fascinating thing about this is this is, in fact, how a Go player thinks. When I look at this board, I've played enough games now that I have very similar thoughts. I don't think I'm going to play a black stone in the middle. I know that's never going to win a game. I've, you know, I've not tried it too often because I've had people tell me, but it's not going to win a game. I am looking at this. This is a nice extension because uh, it's going to maybe give me some territory here, maybe give me some territory here. These three moves are ways to take part of this corner away from white. My eye, as a Go player, even without the green dots on here, I'm looking in these same places. Now, I'm not a perfect Go player. I'm not the best player in the world. I might consider some things that, that it's not. Um, but this is very much, and more than that, I think, okay, what if white goes here? Well, then black's going to go have to go here. Then white might go here. White's starting to build. I am also doing this stepping forward. It's called reading in Go. I'm reading out a few moves to see what the board looks like in my mind and decide for myself, does it look like I'm more likely to win if I do that? And then I try to try that move. So as far as the uh, philosophical aspect of this, I do find it interesting that this mathematical model of how we believe neurons work in the mind is producing results that look very much like I, as a human mind, would think about the game. I'll pause again for questions if there are any. Uh, I think Karim has a question. Yes. Um, so, Steve, you mentioned more likely, um, mm -hmm. and and so to, I'm just trying to <laughs> clarify this to myself. Sure. Um, how does the how does the machine know which move is more likely? Is, is in 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 terms of the you know being a better move, right? Because it would seem that it it would have before making every next move, the machine would have to play the whole game yes to the very end and then say yes that move is better than all these and by the way all other moves are you mentioned they are there are more moves than the atoms in, in the universe so so i mean it's like it i would think that machine probably draws the line somewhere uh in in the game because playing the whole game for so each, need, each and every yeah. move, just to determine which one is more likely, it just seems like right. it's a never-ending task because there, there are a lot of Correct. atoms in the universe. So yeah, I need I need to clarify something because I understand why you're why you're saying that, and I, I need to clarify something. What I'm describing here is how AlphaGo plays the game. This is after it's been trained. So the training, which I am going to talk about a little bit more here in a minute. The training is, now when they first did AlphaGo, they used human professional games and they showed it human professional games. And so it knew the game to the end and it knew who won and who lost. 
And so that training data, just like pictures of penguins, that training data had wins for black and wins for white. And that training data ended up through this reinforced supervised learning, um, coming up with a, mat a, a matrix of weights that becomes AlphaGo's brain, so to speak. What I'm describing here is what how it's using that brain. And so you're, you're right, it's not playing, it, it's already done the playing out the games. It's already got the weights. And so when it looks at this move, it already knows, oh, I know that move is a little bit better because I've been trained and I've seen a bunch of games where, where that seemed to be better. Oh, right. so, so, so in other words, it's been already kind of a little bit pre-trained before it's... It has, it has been entirely pre-trained. I didn't okay. make that distinction and I should okay. have. Yeah, that, that this is how sense. AlphaGo plays the game. After right, it because is. because it would seem that without that pre-train, you, you have to basically define the starting point, a couple of starting points, at least one starting point, right? Yeah. Because no, otherwise, it's, it's been trained at this it, point. Because because how otherwise, if you start from a clean slate completely, um, how would a machine know which you know how to make the first step because he, 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 we're going to come to that there's okay. actually an exciting part of the presentation that deals with that in another couple slides i hate to keep putting y'all off but you're anticipating right. <laughs> my presentation here this is wonderful all right thank you what other questions do we have yeah i have uh, another question because i know uh one way to trick the computer game is play very stupid so we, mm. we, the pre-training doesn't have the experience so, for example, I put in the very corner one. They probably haven't trained this one. So, how are they going to respond? Yeah. So, it know it has seen game states, and in the human trained AlphaGo, which is all I've talked about so far, it has seen no games where somebody opened by playing in the corner. You don't, if you think about the way that what the goal of the game is, you're not surrounding a whole lot of territory if you put a stone in the very corner. And so in its training data, it's never seen that done. So it knows that is not a good move. Okay, I got you. So, so okay, that, that's the way to do it. So if we fit the stupid game, then they will totally screw up the system. If you trained it on stupid data, it would be a stupid Go player. Yes, it absolutely would. <laughs> that's right. That's why your training data matters. That's why they chose professional games in the human trained AlphaGo rather than amateur games. Oh, they selected the game. They just they are not just randomly. No, no. Yeah, the human all... version of this is uh, based on professional human games. That's what they used as training data. Okay, and Joe has a question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I was actually going to. In a way, just anticipated actually what I was going to ask because it was the idea that's how goodness is actually essentially then determined, correct? Um, so the idea of what is good, and in a way, that's the way kind of even humans will actually determine what is good is the reward, which the reward is essentially win or lose, right? Correct. But, um, no. It's interesting that, and I'll, I'll talk about, I might forget it, so I'm going to say it now. An interesting feature of AlphaGo, as a human player, you want to you win, so you want to get a lot more points than your opponent, right? So you tend to make moves that try and grab more. You, you're a little aggressive. AlphaGo was trained on did you win or lose. It does not care whether I won by half a point or whether I won by 10 points or 20 points. Just did I win? And that's part of why AlphaGo became so strong is it, it doesn't have that instinct to want to be sure you win. It oh. just says, hey, is this the best move? And whether it's a half a point or 10, I still won the game. That's all it cares about. And that's why these domain models are so strong, essentially, specifically. Um, the, the, the output was win or loss, not number of points. Exactly. So like even, um, yeah, it's not how you play the game, so to speak. Uh, it, it's so it's it's um, well, it is a how to a certain degree, but even in a sense, this is why some of them don't scale out to other domains like these models essentially. But that's outside other of the knowledge domain. domains, yes, 
Yeah, that's another interesting that's question. Another, there's there's that alpha. Awesome. But yeah, I'm sorry to bring that up. That's quite all right. There's I'm going to refer to Alpha Zero, which was trained to play multiple games at the, near the end. Okay. Anything else? Uh, we have uh, Metheran and uh, Jameson. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Steve. This is really great. I am wondering about um, the, what, what I would call the issue of fairness in a way. Um, in other words, you are taking something that can do um, many hundreds or even thousands of iterations in a very short amount of time compared to a human being. Furthermore, with AlphaGo, you have a large team of people feeding information into it, correcting where the errors are. Now, that is like going to go school when you're a child. Um, mm -hmm. because you do get, you do watch, um, samples of master games. You do get a lot of people correcting your errors, but you don't get the same level of intensive input, um, that AlphaGo got unless you're a very good player. Um, AlphaGo does not sleep and, um, <laughs> it also does not get does nervous. Not... <laughs> right. It doesn't get nervous. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a it's a cognition machine. Um, so it's okay with it if it wins by one point. Um, it doesn't have to definitively, you know, kill the enemy. Uh, it just has to disable it and its job is done. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are a number of points where uh, the issue of fairness arises in terms of a single human being playing against uh, AlphaGo. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's a very, yeah. that's a very interesting question. And what was it? Uh, was it John Mills was a pile driving man. What's what's the tall tale? The guy digging his way through a tunnel against the machine. This this is not a new concept, right? Do you know Do you know the tall tale? Is it John Mills? That doesn't sound right. Does anybody know the? It's a American tall tale. I know we have a pretty John Henry crowd in this group. What is it? John Henry. John Henry, that's it. John Henry was a pile driving man. And it's, it's a tall tale out of American culture where it's when they were, you know, you dig a hole and you stick in the dynamite to blow the next bit of rock apart to dig tunnels. And and there was the, uh, John Henry was the best human at it. But then in the machine age, they invented a machine that could do it. And he raced it through the mountain. As I recall, he won and then died. So fairness. Okay, you're right, Madeline. The one advantage we have more neurons. And that really is kind of how this race took shape. We had more neurons with more connections and we were winning for a while. And eventually this thing has gotten better. But you know, fair, what you'll what you're gonna see in the very end of this is AlphaGo has become a Go teacher now. And professionals are actually paying attention to it now. I'm gonna go through kind of that history here in, in a in a couple minutes. Um, I need to watch my time a little bit, but there any are there any other questions there? Yeah, they have uh, Jameson. Yeah, because Steve okay. needs to leave in uh, another twenty minutes. Yeah, I think I'll get there. I just need to. I'm keeping an eye on it. Go ahead, Jameson. Oh, okay, yeah, just uh, real real quick. I was gonna um, say about the other domain thing. I know we want to focus on Go because I'm interested in it too. I was watching that Go some South Korean Go uh, documentary on a challenge. Uh, yep. That was interesting, yeah. But uh, what I was going to say is, as far as um, just it's math. My understanding, you know, words matter and the math matter. So, uh, like, it's just all fundamentally getting recorded in the back end as far as math and in this particular application of the AI. That training library just has all of the mathematical permeations of you know that I, I what would it be the entry moves the existing state and anticipated moves and it just produces like quick lookup keys right the, it so, ends up with a matrix that it then becomes its brain it's the neurons with the reinforcements and so you put in an input poof through the equation you get an output 
Right. So, but as far as the term like a dumb or a smart uh, situation, it would be relative to the number of instances it was exposed to. And I, I don't think that if you have, if you, you could have, you could start out with a, a model that was poorly trained and that it only saw four moves, but eventually over time, if you populated it, it would be as if it were, right? It would be just like any other model. It's all the same math, the same. So, because I, I was just I, wanting to clarify. You that, know, I, I swear, people, I'm not paying these guys. You've anticipated another slide I'm going to go through. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are really uh, anticipating marvelously. Let's see if it's the next slide. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so now, now we're going to jump out and just talk about sort of the Kasparov equivalent story. And the Korean you're talking about was Lee Sedol right here. So in the 1990s, there were programs. They were not neural networks. They were more of the decision tree, other, other methods. Um, and they could beat amateurs. I mean, they, they could probably still beat me. I've gotten a little better, but by the 2000s, yeah, intermediate players were uh, beatable. Today, I have a program on this laptop I'm talking to you on called Katigo, Katigo, which is uh, stronger than the strongest players in the world. Some of you may know uh, ELO. It's a it's often used in chess. It's a, it's a rating. All you really need to know is the higher the number, the stronger the player. I have down here at the bottom the way ELO is defined is if you're 200 ELO points better than your opponent, you're predicted to have about a 75 percent chance to win. So it kind of gives you a sense of the scale. I didn't talk about rankings in Go. If you've never played the game, never heard of it, you are a 30 Q player. Then the rankings go down, 29, 28, 27. By the time you've learned the rules and played a couple of games, you're already like a 25Q player. And it keeps going down and down and down. I have been playing for about nine years, not studying super duper hard, but I have been. I'm now probably 5Q, 4Q. Then it goes down to 1Q, and then you flop, flip over to 1Don, 2Don, 3Don, 4Don, up to 7Don, amateur. And then above that, you have one Don professional, nine uh, up to nine Don professional. So you can see how many ranks there are. This is a very deep game. You really can spend the rest of your life continuing to improve. So these 2P, 9P, these are ranks. And so P means they are professional players. They, they, they play for money and pride, country pride. 9P are the best in the world. So... Google um, was the one that created AlphaGo. Um, I forget if they were called Alphabet yet. Or DeepMind, I think, was the name of the division at the time. And they made an initial version. They're trying to get Go players to play it, professionals to play it. And just like in chess, they're like, you know, Go, your computer's never going to beat me. We've, you know, we've we've seen what you can do. But they eventually talked to European cha champion Fan Hui, and please forgive my Chinese pronunciations. Um, so he's a Chinese-born French-European champion. And they gave him a series of five games. And AlphaGo won 5-0. Uh, they were um, took notice. The world began to take notice of this program. At that time, the ELO score of the program, AlphaGo Fon, is 3144. This was the first professional player defeat by the program. This is the one that made bigger news because now everybody was watching. I literally stayed up through the night in March of 2016 to watch these games. This is the game, the series that somebody else mentioned, the Korean lease at all. This is the first nine Don professional. They played a five game series and it was four to one. The one is interesting. And this goes to someone's point about confuse the program. Um, the one game that Lee it all want, there is a concept in the game of Go. It is a very subtle game. You, you, you need to push, but you can't push too hard. You need to attack, but you need to be ready to defend. It is a game of balance. And there is a concept in the game of Go of the divine move. A move on that big old 19 by 19 board that the placement of that stone has such a beautiful, subtle effect that it changes 
the complexion of the game. I think it was the fourth of five games, if I remember correctly, not, don't quote me on that one, but Lisa Dahl played a move that AlphaGo was not ready for. In all of its human-trained games, it ain't seen that before. It's exactly what you were saying. I think it was Jason. It got confused. It was very interesting to watch because at this point, everybody's watching. So when you watch a game, a, a game of Go, they have professional players that are commentating the game, explaining what this move is maybe trying to do, what the defenses are, and you could hear the the the, the uh, comment commentators looking, at, starting to look at the moves, like, what is it? doing and that before long even my less experienced at that time player i'm looking at what is it doing it got confused it got confronted with a move it hadn't seen before and didn't know what to do with it that was kind of a beautiful moment well then they continued on um they wanted to challenge uh Kidji, which is at that time was the number one in the world he was the world champ and eventually they conceded to play um, and it was 3-0. I, I, I didn't mention this. This was also interesting. So I mentioned you um, have online go. Well, online, you don't know who you're playing, right? Just a name on the screen. Well, between Lee Sedol and the Kajia game, uh, there appeared a player online that went by the name of Master. It was really good. It was too good people were beginning to suspect, and in fact, it eventually came out that it was a newer version of AlphaGo. You notice how it's getting stronger here. Uh, and so online against many, many players, but among the online professional player games, it won 60 naught. So then they played Kaju, 3-0. And now, let's see, AlphaGo Master, now is this is this is the next step, and I'm going to talk about this on the next slide. You guys were talking about the, the training data that goes into it, and if it didn't have training data, how would it know what to do at all? Excellent point. Between AlphaGo Master, AlphaGo Zero is the first one that was had no human training. They essentially gave the computer an empty board and said, "Play. Somebody will win." Play through a whole game. White or black is going to win this game, and then you'll have a new data point. Play another game. Somebody's going to win that game. I don't care how random you are. By the end of the game, someone will have won. Now you have another data point. And so it started with just the rules and no human input at all. And it eventually got even stronger. I'm going to talk about this more on the next slide. Um, again, I'm hidden. I can't see my whole thing. Oh, here, AlphaGo Zero is the bottom line there. Um, AlphaGo Z Al Alpha Zero. It's no longer AlphaGo Zero. Somebody else brought up more generalized programs. This one was actually a generalized program that could play Go, Shoji, and chess. And it had a 60-40 against AlphaGo Zero. So AlphaGo played AlphaGo Zero. I'm sorry, I didn't guess I didn't talk about this line in who, who this was AlphaGo playing itself. And so you can see it was getting stronger. Um, the last thing I want to mention on this slide is this chart up here. Again, all you really know is ELO higher is stronger. The nine Don professionals are around 3,000 ELO, so about here. Um, so when I talked about how AlphaGo works, I said it does two things. It looks at the seven previous states of the game board and decides whether this next move is good or bad. And it does a Monte Carlo search. It kind of plays out into the future, plays, plays different moves to see what move leads to an even more likely win. AlphaGo Zero does not do that second thing. It only, uh, no, wait a minute. I'm saying that wrong. I think it does still do that. This, this chart, these are early 90s, uh, 2000s programs. Here's AlphaGo Fawn, AlphaGo Lee, AlphaGo Master, AlphaGo Zero. This last one is the raw network, which means what I was trying to say a minute ago. 
It's the raw network. It does not do the Monte Carlo search. It just looks at the last seven states of the game, says this looks like the, this, this move is the most likely to make me win, and it plays it. It doesn't play it into the future. The program I have on my machine, Kotigo, even my, so the limitation of having it on my laptop is my, I don't have a powerful computer. I can't play out a whole bunch of Monte Carlos. You saw me when I was reading those numbers, it was like 77 plays out, 68 plays out. If you have a more powerful computer, it does hundreds of plays out. But even if it did no plays out at all, and it just said, here's, I'm looking at the board, this looks like the right spot. It is now nine Don profession. That is kind of impressive. So even though my computer can't do much, it's still going to kick my butt every time. Any questions about the history here and some of the some that transpired during that? Okay. Then I'm almost to the end, I think. So AlphaGo learning. So this is what I was talking about a minute ago. Pre-AlphaGo Zero, it used professional games. Starting with AlphaGo Zero, it learned from self-play. This is the graph. These are days in time, and this is that ELO. You can see over time, it is getting stronger. This horizontal line here is AlphaGo Lee, the one that beat Lee Sedol. Um, <laughs> And and you can see after three and a half hours, it's playing random crap. It's exactly what I again. I was it Jameson that was saying that or John? I can't remember. It was playing random crap, but somebody won that <laughs> game and decided whether that move was good or bad. After just another half hour, now mind you, and I meant to redo this man. Uh, by in, in the half an hour, I think that might be thirty six thousand games 3600 games it's a lot of games in a half an hour because it's doing 4.9 million games and 16,000 simulations taking a little under a half a second per move in that half an hour you can see there's some organization starting to happen this stuff going on down here this is a case where uh might be a little hard to explain because i didn't really explain the rules in detail but these are stones where white is capturing a black stone and then Black is capturing a white stone and the white, they're kind of going back and forth down here. It's a, it's a co-fight. It's a stupid co-fight, but it's only been at it for four hours. But the AlphaGo Zero does, did learn this way. It's training started stupid. ELO of negative 3,500. Dumb. Eventually got better, eventually got better, eventually got very good. And after uh, 72 hours, can't see my whole screen. Those are hours, not days. I said, I think I said days. After three days, 72 hours, it was already well over a nine dawn professional. This game, this graph over here, get that out of my way. Which one is this? Oh, this is 20 blocks and 40 blocks, I think, which is the amount of computing power behind it. I'm not going to belabor that, but you can see it, it came up quickly. This, again, I just, I find this fascinating. So AlphaGo has learned to play Go from scratch. And there's more yet to say, but I'll pause one more time here for questions, if there are any. Yes, Clint. Uh, thank you, Steve, for clarifying this. Um, I I think I can grasp you know the how the algorithm would work once you have some training and just after that it's just you know pure math and you keep crunching the the numbers and, and run you know running multiple cycles many times so it's all i mean it's it pretty much very basic like you said very very basic math uh that machine would do but something that a human would do also but you know, at, a, at a much slower it, it, rate it but, mimics yeah yeah right Go ahead. but 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 my question is more um you know, you know this parable about like a dog that you you put um two plates of food in front of it and it just it's it's sort of paralyzed it doesn't know which one to choose uh because both seem equally good and so for a while, the dog stares at, at the two bowls or two plates and like in, in 
hesitation, like deciding which which one is good. So for for the machine in to kind of use that analogy, um, when it when it, there's literally no reference points, like in the beginning of the process, uh, like in yeah that particular square that right. where you where you said that mm -hmm. it it randomly made moves. Like what makes a machine to make a completely random move and why it would choose this move versus the other and i guess there are right. there's the obvious an answer to that i'm, I'm just not a, an it specialist or, or a mathematician so right. it's it kind of it, it completely blows my mind like how would in the absence of any reference points how would a machine make that random move as opposed to the the an, an, an alternative or a myriad of alternatives i understand the question and it's a good one um, the answer is, so remember we said when I had the picture of this picture, um, and I said, so you put in the inputs, you get the output, you tell it what was right or wrong, and then it says, oh, okay, well, I'm going to tweak these parameters a little bit. It tweaks the matrix, okay? In the very beginning, it is, it's running on a matrix. It's just one that is mostly wrong. How does it decide which one? It uses the stupid brain it has at that moment. And that stupid brain, that matrix, that matrix of, of weights, and it uses it. And it says, oh, yep, that's the best move. I'll do that one. And it does that one. And then somebody wins and says, oh, next time, oh, yeah, that wasn't such a good move. I'm going to do a different one. And so that's what it's doing, is it's using the matrix as it's developing to make the next move. I guess, I guess I'm still confused about it because why would it make that stupid move as opposed to another stupid move? Like what because would- That's what its stupid brain told it to do. The oh. stupid brain has an opinion. It's a stupid oh. brain, but it has an opinion. We've met, we've met people like this. And so it, it has an opinion about what move is the right one. And it says, okay, I'll do that. It does that. All right. I mean, in, I think, I think like a human being would probably always have a reference point. Um, I was stupid when I started. Well, well, but we still. I mean, I could I could explain to myself why I would make yeah. this particular move than the other because we already have a baggage. We, you know, we we came into this world. We were, you know, we went. I don't know, like to the kindergarten. Our parents taught us some. You know, we we start. Let's say I'm like a five year old child. You know, I already can distinguish colors. I have my own preferences. I know how to, you know, how to go to the restroom by myself. So it's like there's a lot of baggage in my consciousness that prompts me to choose. I mean, maybe I just like the color of the piece of this piece better yeah. than than the other, and so I make that. But how, but machine has absolutely no reference points. So that's to me, it's like a it's a complete mystery. Like how would a move actually happen there? Like there has it, to be something could, in the machine, could, unless you pre still have some some pre programming in it, like sort of like a bee, you know, like, like bees that they, they have their own language and yeah. they already know how to dance, you know. You know but I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. You, I need I need to cut you off, and I deeply apologize. God, I would love to continue this conversation, but I'm running out of time, so I am so sorry. But I'm going to cut you off. Um, the answer is, you know, you didn't have, you didn't always know how to clean your how to wipe your bottom. The baby didn't know how to play Go. For a Go player beginning, you gain so a lot of that wisdom because the person you're playing against says, "No, don't play there. Play here. That the, the, this is better." And as a human, that's how you start to learn. Um, for the random game, the first game is completely <clears throat> random. From there, it starts to get an opinion. Let me get through the last slide. I am so sorry. I'm really enjoying this, and I need to cut out, but I'm going to have to. So I think this is my last slide. Yes, this is my last slide. So professional players didn't want to believe this AlphaGo thing. And it was interesting. Um, Michael Redman is a nine-don professional American player, uh, the first nine-don American professional player. And he was commentating games. And he was very, very cautious about describing how the AlphaGo was thinking very didn't want to say it was thinking you would say the algorithm came up with this the algorithm came up with that and as AlphaGo has become more popular and as my, Michael Redmond and others looked at more and more games that were played by AlphaGo and some of those AlphaGo against AlphaGo games 
the language started to change. And they're now refer to it as, I think when it made this move, it was thinking that it was going to do this. And a nine Don professional player, you know, has better answers than I do. Um, fascinating. It really has evolved. I mentioned Joseki are patterns that happen usually in the corners and they're common because they're about even. Because if it wasn't even, you, somebody would figure out something better. So, you know, you kind of get optimized. Human players developed Joseki over history. They don't, they don't stay the same. Somebody, it's a Joseki for a while. It's a particular pattern like this maybe. And after a while, some human tries something different and they start winning more games. So that new Joseki becomes popular for a while. And then somebody figures out some other version. Fuseki are just like Joseki, but they're openings. They're common openings. Um, these charts are the AlphaGo working with no human input. This is the, the self-trained. This is the 72 hours. And this is the number of times this pattern appeared in the game. And so you can see this pattern, which me as a Go player, I look at that and I'm like, that doesn't make sense. Well, it figured that out within the first few hours. It became a popular thing to try, and then it was not working. It found better things to do. This one looks a little bit more like Joseki that I that I know. It's not really quite it, but it's close. And sure enough, it became liked it, and then it started finding better things to do. The another fascinating thing about this to me, AlphaGo training from nothing went through a very similar path of Joseki than humans that humans did. It discovered the same Joseki that humans did over thousands of years of play. And th so this is this is one of the Josekis I learned before AlphaGo started. This this pattern. Notice AlphaGo has decided there are better things to do. Like this. This is a new this Joseki is new after AlphaGo began to show, show this stuff to us. And now professional players try this and win more games. So that fascinates me too, that it really did go through a human development, a, a human-like development. It's thinking like a human. That is my last slide. I will try and take a couple more questions. And then I, I don't think I said I have symphony tickets tonight. I'm, that's why I was wearing a tie. Oh, and I have Go cufflinks. I didn't show you my Go cufflinks. I made Go stones. <laughs> made cufflinks out of Go stones because <laughs> I'm a nerd. But I will take a couple more questions if there are some. Yeah, uh, Steve, I thank you so much. You know, and uh, we respect your time. Uh, I just want to ask one personal, a little bit personal question. As a Go player, how do you feel when you know? There's no human has any possibility to win the computer. So Lisa Dahl, I'll tell you how Lisa Dahl felt. Um, he lost those games, and then AlphaGo became more powerful, and he chose to retire. For exactly that reason. He, he said, you know, there's... It was kind of like there's no mystery now. Like, I can't... There's, there's no way... I can improve. He actually retired. I think that reaction is in the minority. Um, most players, certainly us amateurs who want to get better, Alpha Go has become the sensei, Sifu. It's become our teacher. Um, we are learning from it. Um, this this is a program. This is the Kata Go program I was talking about. It gives you a little win chart, tells you how likely you are to win or lose. I remember this game. You'll notice this very sharp drop here. That is this point in the game. And I remember trying to decide, should I go here or there? And I debated it for a while. It turns out I made the wrong choice. <laughs> and Alpha, I got to go and it, but I didn't. Um, yeah, it's becoming a teacher. Does it remove the magic? Not for me. I've got plenty of magic left. I'm not that good. So, But yeah, that's a good question. Anything else? Okay. Well, I uh, thank you very uh, much. I really enjoyed this. I very much enjoyed the questions. Um, sorry, I cannot stick around and just go on ad nauseum. Let's see, let me stop sharing. I'll put my camera back on here one more time. 
So thank you all very much. I really enjoyed that. I hope you did too. And uh, if you want to play Go, we're going to try and teach you online. Um, we'll just keep looking at uh, Jason's uh, meetup group. I will be asking people to commit ahead of time because like I said, we're going to use an online Go server and I want to get you set up on there first so that we're not spending the first half hour with everybody. What button do I push? So we'll we'll try and we'll put that in the meeting notice when we put it out. Yeah, I, I probably will announce like one month ahead of time. So you know we have the time to you know decide you know who is going to play, and then we probably don't expect have a large crowd. But I believe if you are interested, you know, welcome to join. And it's associated the the philosophy and the, and like I can tell, Joe asked a very philosophical question about good and the bad. So <laughs> yeah, and and uh, was it Madeline about is it fair? You yeah, know? and then if you <laughs> have been in the uh, my session about art of war. Okay, the concept of shi. Right. Okay, that's yes. all. If you play go game, you will know exactly what I meant. Chinese mean yes. shi. Okay, <laughs> absolutely. All right. Well, I am going to run. Um, thank you all very much, and maybe I'll see you another time. Yeah, days. thank you, Steve. And I will stick here uh, for uh, a few minutes. And well, if you have a question and you want to discuss, and you are welcome. You know, so thank you again, Steve. Oh, the next week <laughs> we are doing the Bhagavad Gita, and SK is going to talk about chapter eleven. Okay, so uh, see you next time. Thank you, Steve. Right and thank you.